the nine mile drainage is extremely unique. Uh, if you looked at uh, the Missoula Valley um, from a satellite, you can see that there's an extremely large fracture zone right here in this portion of the Rocky Mountains where all these big major valleys and, and valley trenches come together. And there's a little kind of mountain range that connects them all, and that's the Nine Mile Valley Reservation Divide. It's a very important uh, linkage zone for wildlife just in general, in, into eternity. The way all of the valleys and ridgelines come together into the Missoula Valley and the, and the Bitterroot and Clark Fork Valleys, there's a little avenue of um, wildness that uh, corresponds to the way the mountain ranges hook into each other. And uh, Nine Mile Valley has already shown how unique it is. Uh, we've had wolves show up there uh, and establish packs over and over again. We've had grizzlies show up in the valley, uh, bountiful wildlife. We have a, a very vast whitetail herd that uses that uh, drainage. Lots of mule deer, tons of elk. It's right in the right spot. And, th and that's why I've always admired that area and try to spend as much time in there as possible. If you look to the north, um, <clears throat> the Flathead River flows down out of the Flathead Valley, and there's a lot of just lush riparian vegetation there. Uh, beautiful uh, shrub fields filled with choke cherry, service berry. And we are seeing where uh, grizzlies uh, are coming down out of the missions following some of those bigger drainages into the uh, river bottoms of the Flathead Valley. From there, it's just a, a, a simple climb up the hill to the reservation divide and down into the Nine Mile Valley. And then uh, once you get into the riparian areas uh, of the Nine Mile Valley, again, you've got these sort of wonderful shrub fields, choke cherry service bridges hanging heavy all along the Nine Mile Creek. It goes right into the Clark Fork River again into the Grass Valley where you have prime wildlife habitat. Pretty much from Alberton upstream through the Missoula Valley all the way up the Bitterroot Valley, you have just this lush riparian zone. Cottonwoods, choke cherries, uh, service berries, rose hip, just wonderful wildlife habitat. And that's why this whole area is so unique where all the mountain ranges come together, all the rivers come together. It's some of the primest wildlife habitat we have in Montana. And um, the Nine Miles right smack in the middle of it. And in terms of connectivity for wildlife in general, uh, and I'm talking down the road, you know, the next 100 years, 200 years, the more we can do to, you know, save that and establish um, linkage zones, not for predators, not for wolves, not for grizzlies, but all wildlife, uh, your forest carnivores, your wolverines. As more of western Montana builds up, we won't have these travel routes. And if we have an established connective highway, in essence, for wildlife to travel from point A to point B for eternity, we're just helping the system out. So that's why I think the Nine Mile is such a high priority area. In terms of wildlife, the Nine Mile is very rich. Again, we have you know a 25-mile mountain river coming out of a, a fairly substantial mountain range with a big, flat, lower valley floor, lots and lots of food. It's just prime deer habitat, prime predator habitat. In the bottoms, lots of white-tailed deer. And up on the sides, on the Stark Mountain side and also the Reservation Divide side, just some wonderful elk habitat, wonderful black bear habitat, lots of mule deer. They come they from north, they kind of winter up in that area. Then in the spring when it just starts uh, greening up good, then they'll come in here for about a month. And then when it's cabin season, then they'll start moving back okay. and stay back until later in the fall they'll come back again. So we'll, in fact, when they have their calves. When their calves get about a month or so old, some of the cows and calves will come out in here. This spring we've had up to 165 head of elk in here approximately two months ago for about a month. Then they did uh, go back for the calving season. How do you feel about that? Are you okay with the elk here? 
Yeah, some of the elk is okay, but when they get too many, uh, we should uh, kind of harvest them as we uh, keep the herds uh, to a medium size. But it's nice to see the elk and the deer too. There's some very important wintering grounds for elk in the Nine Mile. One of the most important being the Cayos Hill. It's a little isolated mountain knob coming off the horn of the main ridge systems and, and elk for some reason love to winter in those types of areas. And Cayuse Hill has always been an excellent area for wintering elk. Animals and in particular we see a lot of sign of elk activity here bed down up on the top of the hill here in the wooded area and then they want to cross the interstate so what they do is is follow these lateral trails along the side of the road cut until they come to the one trail that everyone seems to agree on using and by that we mean elk, white tails, etc. including bears for that matter, black bears. And then they make a run for it across the interstate, end up on the south side having to maneuver across a fence and then they pick up the trail on the south side of the interstate and from there they seem to head either east or west. What doesn't show here but what we know is there from climbing over that slight ridge is a wetland. It's a, a, a wonderful wet area right on the side of the Clark Fork River full of nutritious grasses so of course they, they love that. That's just what they need. And from there it's a case of swimming the river and then again you're over on the south side of the Clark Fork and pretty much into Forest Service lands again. We have even had a bighorn roadkill, but it did tell us that even bighorns are using this crossing. For that matter, multiple black bears over the years. We've even had a wolf in the kill zone here at the base of Cayuse Hill. And of course, wolves, the predators are always following the herds of, of ungulates, so we know that that signifies also it's a pretty important crossing. You can see the gradient of I-90 here cutting across Cayuse Hill. Coming down that hill is a concrete barrier down the center median, what's called a Jersey Rail. And obviously where the animals are choosing to cross is just below that rail, so clearly it's a wildlife obstruction. The fencing that lines into states is not at all wildlife friendly fencing by any means. It's meant to keep livestock off the interstate. It's built with three strands of barbed wire on the top. Overall it's essentially about four feet high. The lower part is made up of a woven mesh. Young of either deer or elk cannot get through it. Uh, it looks like in places the adult uh, tries to push down the mesh part so that the, child, the young one can get through. Oftentimes, and we've seen the sad side of a fawn hung up in the fence and it, clearly it died there and we had one place where we just saw this little, little tiny fawn's hoof and ankle just stuck in the middle of that mesh uh, where clearly one didn't make it. The situation here at Cayuse Hill uh, presents our most formidable challenge as a work group. Uh, the area is known to residents as the kill zone. Um, there's no alternatives for animals to use. They can't go, uh, there's nothing to go around. There are no underpasses, culverts. There's no way they can possibly avoid crossing the pavement. Um, and of course, that means any solution would have to involve uh, megabucks when it comes to uh, the highway department looking at something like an overpass or a slightly lesser expense uh, underpass but still formidable expense since the interstate is a done deal it's a highway that's already constructed and any structural um, addendums to it would cost a great deal of money so in the meantime we were trying to work with highway department to at least post uh, high impact wildlife crossing type signs or in some way mark it because because as well as being hazardous for wildlife, quite obviously it's a public safety issue as well. Of course, the uh, highways with high speeds, 80 miles an hour or so, take their toll on more than mammals. Here's one of our avian friends that clearly didn't make it across that movement corridor either. It's quite sad. Uh, in the last 25 years, the Nine Mile Valley has uh, become more fractured through um, 
the subdivision of residential properties, or I mean agricultural properties into residential properties. It's a great place to live, but it's also becoming more and more congested. Uh, the wildlife aren't ever going to stop using it. It's just such lush habitat that we'll always have bears, we'll always have wolves, we'll always have deer and elk trying to use this country. But um, with the way uh, the land is being developed, it's making it more and more difficult for you know, elk to get to their wintering ground on Cayuse Hill. And Cayuse Hill is actually, you know, private, a lot, large part of it, and it's being developed. And so, you know, down the road, those elk are gonna have to shift elsewhere. Well, the biggest challenges that I see for the, the future of, of Nine Mile Creek or Nine Mile Drainage is uh, number one, unprecedented development. There's quite a bit of private land up there and a good portion of it has already been developed, subdivided. But the potential to have even more of it developed is there. And anything that people could do to preserve some of those larger tracts of wild agricultural land up in the headwaters would be wonderful. Uh, if those properties get developed, it'll be pretty tough. Right now, wildlife can move freely across the valley in the headwaters, uh, basically upstream from McCormick. It's still not that built up. If uh, some very large subdivisions go up into the upper reaches of the Nine Mile Valley, and if the highway is paved on over the top of Seagull Pass, um, <clears throat> it'll be a direct link to the uh, uh, Coeur d'Alene area, um, we'll see a lot more people moving into the Paradise, St. Regis, Nine Mile. Uh, the commute won't be as bad. So uh, the potential for uh, more development is there. So anything that people can do to preserve some of that uh, uh, private property and keep it in a, uh, you know, kind of a agricultural form for cattle ranching, logging would be wonderful. Uh, I'd much rather see uh, some ranching and logging uh, instead of development. Other major obstruction to the Nine Mile Valley in terms of a linkage zone into the Bitterroot bitter ecosystem for all wildlife is Interstate 90. I think the interstate stops most of them. I, I've never seen them cross through here, but above our place, they do cross, and we can see a lot of tracks and trails that they, they use, and it's over the steep banks right into the interstate, which is not the best for uh, the drivers and the elk and deer. It's kind of a, a serious deal. We've had a serious accident here about three weeks ago. Deer and elk cannot go in that culvert. The biggest area height is only probably three or four feet some places. So I, I think it's too uh, scared of a deal for even the deer to go through it. I've never seen a deer, heard of one going through there. Elk, it's impossible. The only, as the smaller animals like the otters, beavers, and that type will go through it. There are ways for wildlife to get across the highway especially there uh, around the big oxbow or bend in the river <coughs> at the mouth of Nine Mile. But it wouldn't hurt if we could work with the highway department to enhance some of that travel uh, or some of those crossing potentials for wildlife. You know, they're there now. Uh, they could disappear with a new bridge or some construction. So anything that we do down the road to enhance the ability for wildlife to cross to the south would be great. There are some private lands to the south as well at the base of the ridge coming off of Petty Mountain right where it hooks into that um, big oxbow at the mouth of Nine Mile. 
if we could do anything to work with the property owners uh, to preserve that and keep it open space uh, and then work with some of the wildlife crossings there uh, on that portion of Interstate 90, it would be great because it's very important uh, linkage zone. When you see the elk coming down, are they coming down clear over there off of that property before they cross I-90? Because that's real steep right there. Yeah. When they when they come down out of the tree line up there, they feed down and then... On the bench? Right. And they'll sometimes go to the right, sometimes they go to the left. But when they go to the left, they go back up into the trees. Okay. And on the right, where I'm situated, I cannot see where they where cross the river. Down in there. But that whole area up there is their sanctuary. That's where they calve out and everything up there. But the uh, the ranch up there, they protect them. That you know, there's no access to them. And that if uh, you look to the south from the Nine Mile Valley, you have uh, several large drainages that include Albert Creek, Deep Creek, and Petty Creek, and it's very wild. Again good, rich wildlife habitat. Further to the west, you have Fish Creek and, of course, the Great Burn. But in that Petty Creek area, you have a bighorn sheep herd. Again, lots of elk, lots of deer, and a few reports of grizzly bears that may have crossed through that nine mile area. A little bit of wolf activity. But again, um, you know, there, there's even talk of paving Petty Creek. And if you have Petty Creek paved and you have Nine Mile paved, uh, it's just a straight shot down the Bitterroot. It's a straight shot to over to Lake Coeur d'Alene. Again, um, any sort of improvements on, on the road systems in there will really increase uh, the development of private lands. And uh, it's sad, you know, everyone wants to live out in the West here, um, <clears throat> but uh, you can love uh, what you love to death and and by encouraging development in, in these areas we'll essentially lose <coughs> a lot of this very important area um, that uh, that fracture zone that I was talking about with those mountain ranges all coming together if if we get so much congestion in the valley floors even if it's a, a, a 300 400 yard strip of residential subdivision, that's a huge barrier, much more of a barrier than Interstate 90. Because <clears throat> once they get across Interstate 90, and if they don't get hit and killed by a vehicle, they're there. But what's wrong with, um, or the problem with having uh, uh, subdivision and, and uh, uh, d the development of private lands in these creek bottoms is it's it's, there are always going to be these attractants that are going to be luring in animals so that the conflicts will occur over and over and over again through time. What specific concerns do you have about this area? I guess development uh, and then blocking off the wildlife to uh, where they don't, don't have their natural traffic patterns. Every day or you can drive down the road and see roadkill, usually deer, but there are too many elk and other animals getting hit occasionally. But it's, it's just beautiful, and uh, if we can provide access across this river and all across the roads, why, that's for the better. What types of wildlife do you see in this area? All of it. There's uh, been grizzly down here. There's black bears coming through all the time, fox, coyotes, uh, we have a beaver lodge about 100 yards downstream here with the beavers coming up and eating off a tree and then dragging it down to their house. And then there's all the birds. Probably hear the Canadian geese. Uh, they're getting ready to nest. And then we have all the eagles. There's a bald eagle nest across the river, osprey nest on the other side of the river. And they're just fun to watch and uh, just all the wildlife. But there's not only on this side of the river, but back on the other side of the house, they come down and they, they like the lawns uh, to eat the grass, the new grass, nice green stuff this time of the year. And uh, there'll be a couple of dozen of them down there in the yards. And then they have to pass across uh, Highway 10 going back up into the timber. And occasionally we get one hit by a car going along there. People on their way to work, 
bad light that early in the morning and uh, elk trying to dash across the road and it doesn't work. Well, one of the most effective ways of, of um, dealing <clears throat> with, with growth and, and loss of um, connectivity is if you can get uh, you know the citizens or the locals uh, living in an area you know that still has potential for connectivity uh, to you know get together and create a little work group. Like the nine mile wildlife movement area the citizens work group. If a, a group of citizens get together and uh, start organizing those people will have a lot of impact on agencies like Fish, Wildlife and Parks or Montana Department of Transportation or, or in, in some cases even large private landowners. Not in an antagonistic way but just showing concern and, and documenting that you know this is the last uh, linkage between this ridge line, this bridge, this hay meadow, this island, and this ridge on the opposite side of the valley. And if you get folks working together, trying to show the community and, and agencies that, look, all we have to do is establish a little connectivity here, you can preserve the last connective ground between two mountain ranges. Um, because it's sad, you know, these areas are disappearing rapidly. And um, Nine Mile is, is a good example. We have a lot of development with uh, just a few key little parcels of open space that still connect directly to the river, uh, directly to the uh, Interstate 90's bridge span over the Clark Fork River, over to some very nice uh, open space, still you know undeveloped private land to the south. In five years that, that open space connectivity could be gone. And then the other thing you should all know about, uh, two meetings on Wednesday, next Wednesday, the 29th. Unfortunately, they're scheduled together. Um, the first one is in Missoula, and it's Montana Fish, Wildlife, and Parks, and it's to get public input on the, uh, the action plan for their conservation strategy. Conflicting yeah. with that is right here at Nine Mile, the Nine Mile uh, Ranger District's community meeting, which will be right in this very room at 7 o'clock. So, um, <laughs> don't hit any animals as you're tearing up I-90, guys. <laughs> uh, the first item on the agenda, the six-mile Cayuse field trip, um, and I think several of us might have something to say about that. But I would like to thank you guys for having me out there um, and inviting an aquatic staff because recognizing that there are, I guess, dual issues out there with wildlife and with aquatics. Um, so I, most of you guys probably know, but fish are migratory creatures. They're not maybe as um, charismatic as wildlife that, that you guys are interested in and deal with, but migration and passage is real important, and fish need to move at various scales, um, temporal scales. They move daily. They can move seasonally. They can move annually. They move daily for feeding um, patterns and forays. They can move seasonally or, I guess, more monthly for temperature reasons to seek out temperature refuge, and then seasonally for like spawning migrations to access spawning and production habitats from, from the larger rivers. And that's why this, that's really the crux of that six mile issue. It's, it's um, you know, a potential issue for fish migrating up from the Clark Fork River into the um, production areas of six mile. So my, I guess the, the key take home points aquatically, I don't think aquatics are going to be a driver on this. If, if there was, I think, an important enough push because the wildlife folks thought that this is a really important crossing, whatever design that would occur there, I think would be something that, that we could then kind of fit our fish passage design into. Some of the work that you guys are doing with cameras has been very effective in that you know you're verifying how wildlife are you know coming down existing game trail systems crossing the river uh, going under the bridge span on interstate 90 
and utilizing, you know, nice hay meadows on the opposite side of the river, or maybe even continuing south into the bitterroots. If you get enough pictures showing, you know, a small herd of elk, uh, four or five deer, a couple of black bears, a couple of lions, trying to make their way across a highway, you know, maybe a department like uh, the highway department or, or fish, wildlife, and parks or, or some land trust companies will start working with that group to enhance that particular wildlife movement area. You know, really, if you just adjust a fence, uh, move some rocks, uh, you can make existing uh, sites much more uh, user friendly for wildlife. Why did you become a member of the Wildlife Movement Area's working group? <laughs> the Wildlife Area Working Group. Interested in uh, what's happening in the area and stuff like that. I saw a notice that they were meeting and decided I would go. And I don't know how many meetings I'd had before I got there. Uh, I understood later that one of my neighbors had already been there two or three times. But it's been interesting and I hope to help. Uh, it's a good cause. What do you want to see happen to this place? <laughs> Not too many changes as really? is really? right oh. as is right now if possible keep it into a little bit of open area and keep farming it the best we can and because it is beautiful and uh, I hate to see it chopped up and any smaller than right now. I love the Nine Mile area, it's beautiful. All the wildlife, the river, uh, it's just beautiful. In 20 years looking out, I, I would hope it hasn't changed that much, uh, this part of the river especially. Uh, all the animals are still here. We've been here since uh, 2002. And every year there's been more floaters on the river. Usually the island out here, it's a favorite place to stop and they set up a card table and they have lunch and uh, then they finish their float. These are people, natives to the area, then people flying in just for a float of the Clark Fork River. I have a son that lives near here and uh, this is just the best place to be. It's, well, it's, it's still natural. It hasn't yeah. been uh, ruined by commercialization yet. So, just hope you know we can preserve it, keep it the way it is. <laughs>